So, for today, we have a sermon I've, I've titled God's Peace, or, uh, you know, with a, with a little bit of a, you know, embellished subtitle, The Peace, subtitled The Glorious Testimony of Peace from the Great and the Lowly, and I, I think you'll, you'll get to understand that as, as we go uh, through here. And so, if you've been around at church at Christmas time, you will likely recognize the text that I shall talk about here in a second. It'll be a very familiar scene to many. So if you've heard this before, I just ask you now to let your ears and your heart hear God's word anew. Let it sink into your heart in a fresh way this evening. So now, for those who are able to stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word, please do so as we read from Luke chapter 2. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that they had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they have seen and heard as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All right, so two main points in this sermon. Keeping this simple, uh, no no three-point thing here. Um, We see two different sets of testimonies here in the text. We see first the angels. So this is called the testimony of the great. So to start the scene, where are we? Well, we're with the shepherds. We're outside in the middle of the night. All is calm, all is bright, right? They're watching their sheep out in the fields outside of Bethlehem. And then in the prior verses in Luke 2, we see that Joseph and Mary have just traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the registration of Caesar Augustus. Mary has just given birth to a son, and she has laid him in a manger, which is feeding trough, right? The shepherds here that we see first, they were the common folk. Their job was outside. They're working with animals, often considered dirty and base. And yet, to the shame of the mighty and to the proud, God chose to announce the birth of Christ not to the scribes or the kings or the rulers, but he came to the shepherds. And so an angel has appeared to the shepherds. An angel shows up. I mean, what do you do? You know, you know you're, you're, you're shocked, right? But to make the origin very clear to the shepherd, God's glory accompanies the angel and shines brilliantly around them. So if you're seeing this brilliant light, it's very clear here in the text, the shepherds recognize where this messenger has come from. They, later they say, the Lord has made it, it known to us, right? And so uh, the angel has come to deliver this message to the shepherds. The shepherds are Jews, and just like we saw uh, the wise men uh, receive a communication from God via the, a message from God via a star, something that they would have understood as astrologers, um, God often chooses to communicate, call us in a language that we individually can understand, right? Um, and, and so you're seeing that the shepherds see uh, the angel very clearly they know recognize they've read stories 
uh, of angels, and, and it's very clear to them what is happening. So just like we saw, if you've read the book of Luke, we just saw Mary earlier uh, in the previous chapter. Angel shows up to Mary, and the angel immediately has to, has to start with a, you know, fear not, uh, don't be afraid, because clearly um, the sight of an angel is, is enough to bring fear to the hearts of men. Um, the men recognize themselves as unworthy in the presence of something that is accompanied with God's glory. I think it's a very fitting reaction. Any of us, I think, would be right to fall to our knees uh, there. So the angels, uh, we've, we've talked about angels in, in various parts of our studies through the Bible, but just, just a quick refresh here. Angels are often functioning as messengers in the Bible. So I think just cutting to it, what is the angel's message here? Verses 9 through 12 give us a lot of things. There's a lot of things here, and, and I'm calling this the testimony of the angel, the, what the angel is declaring and testifying to, the, the news that the angel is bringing. So let's just step through this real quick because it's so good. There's so much in it. Um, what does the angel bring? He says, I bring you good news. So he's proclaiming good news. The word here, uh, actually in the, in the KJV, it was good tidings. Um, you know, the, the word here is gospel. It is, is the, the actual word gospel. So the angel is proclaiming the true gospel. He's proclaiming the news about God's deliverance to his people. God has been promising the Israelites, he's been promising his people that one day a Savior, a Messiah would come and he, here he is announcing the good news to the shepherds. The good news is of great joy. And, and in the Greek, the angel actually says, I evangelize you great joy. Like, I'm, I'm preaching, I'm giving you good news of great joy. I'm, uh, you know, the gospel is centered here on joy, or it has a joy in its response. Joy at its core, at its essence. The news of what God has done in Christ for us can't help but produce joy. It is good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The message of the gospel, the good news here that we're talking about, this great joy that the angels are proclaiming, it is for all the people. To the nation of Israel and to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. The, the message of Christ is not just for the Israelites here, but it's to be proclaimed broadly and generously without restriction or exclusion. He says, good news of great joy for all the people. For unto you it is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. For unto you. For unto you. What is the good news? Why is it good? Why is it full of joy? I think part of it comes here in those little sweet words. The, all of God's word is God-breathed. Every word is special and important and carefully placed. And I think words like this, it, it encouraged me because um, the angel is, the, the testimony here has been spoken with such precision. It's unto you is this proclaimed. And in the middle of this dark night, Something special has happened. Something uh, has happened. And it's not just to the world, but it's being proclaimed to you. To the meek, to the lowly, to the broken, to the dirty and the unclean, to the cast aside and to the slighted, to the worn out and to the shamed. Unto you has Jesus come. Unto you is Jesus proclaimed to you personally and individually. If you feel like any of those today, just hear the message of the gospel that God is proclaiming it is for you. It is unto you that is, it is proclaimed. Just take a second and breathe that in. God has not just sent his beloved son to the world in general. He sent them to you right where you are today. Right where you are today. The word of God beckons you today to claim the promises of Christ as your own. 
a promise of a Savior, of a Messiah for your soul. Unto you is born this day in the city of David. Earlier in Luke 2, we saw that Joseph and Mary went back to Bethlehem for the registration because Joseph was of the house and of the lineage of King David. So Bethlehem, as all the Jews would know, it has a very clear association, right? Um, it's not a perfect analogy, but I was trying to get at it something, and it'd be kind of like saying, um, you know, Washington, D.C. with the U.S. president, right? Like, you think of Washington, D.C., you can't help but think about uh, the U.S. president. And, and here, Bethlehem and King David, the Jews know this association. It's when they hear this, their, their, their ears are probably perking up. They're saying, in the city of David, you know, it, you know, if he's been born in Bethlehem, maybe he's somehow associated with David. Maybe he's associated with being the king that has been promised. Um, and, and it's clear that Jesus' birth there is, is, you know, specifically designed to reference that, right? He's the fulfillment of the, all, the, all the prophecies that the, the prophets had brought to the, the people of Israel over the years of, of a coming king, of a coming Lord, not just to rule through military might like the Israelites might have hoped, but to rule with peace, as we'll talk about. In the city of David, there is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angel is proclaiming three separate titles here, Savior, Christ and Lord. Savior, he's saying that there is someone who has been born to save, someone who has been born to come deliver. He has been born. Christ, the promised Messiah of the Israelites, the anointed one, he has been born. And Lord, the one who would rule and reign as king, as Lord of lords and king of kings. And the angel says that there will be a sign. This will be a sign to you. And he explains what's going to happen. The angels are uh, they're bringing good news to the shepherds. And they're also giving grace, uh, you know, giving something that the shepherds can hold on to. If they go see something, then they will know what the angels are saying is true. It's, it's gracious to, to the shepherds who, who might be having a hard time believing this, right? But what a sign to give, Right? This is not just, um, you know, f f to announce the king of heaven coming. What kind of a sign is this? Such an entrance to, into the world, such humility. He, you know, as, as a line of a song says that I like, he's, it says, you know, he didn't step down from heaven. He took a quantum leap. I mean, he just, you know, it's beyond anything that we could imagine. So completely opposite of our expectations, right? I mean, uh, he's going to be lying in a manger. He's going to be sitting in effectively a food bowl, right, for, for animals. Um, I mean, what do we put our kids in? We put them in these nice old cribs. We, you know, we have the whole, uh, you know, Pinterest uh, with the, uh, you know, nesting. I mean, I, after an exhaustive 10-second internet search, I found the most expensive crib on the internet, um, you can spend $10,000 on a crib here in, in America today. Um, but the king of glory, the king of heaven, when he was born, was placed in a manger. And so <clears throat> then the angel continues, but not by himself. The angel then once solitary, is now joined by an uncountable choir of angels whose job is to proclaim praise and honor to God. And I think their song, we'll, we'll step through it in a second, but the song really, at its core, could be summarized as glory to God and peace to men and women. Peace to mankind. And I think there's a couple things we should notice about the song. I'll, I'll, I'll say it here again. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. There's a couple key things. Firstly, the good news of the gospel naturally leads to praise, right? The angel is proclaiming the gospel, and now other angels are answering with praise as is befitting. John Piper once said, 
missions exist because worship doesn't. And I think that's it here, that the gospel is proclaimed and if, so that we might worship, right? People believing and trusting the gospel leads to worship. Second thing we can notice here, glory, it belongs to God, not to us. His glory is revealed here in many ways, but most clearly, as we see in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, it's, it's that uh, God's glory is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. So the angels here are responding to the revelation of God's glory, the pinnacle of God's glory in his redemption through Jesus. There's a very particular way that the angelic host proclaims peace, and, and, and peace is proclaimed here on earth. And peace is a pretty loaded word, right? It's a big word. There's so many connotations. You ask anyone what is peace, and you're going to get 100 definitions, right? But I think it's worth us stopping and pausing to, to talk about peace. What do the angels mean by peace? What are they aiming at? What, what are they trying to describe? And so <clears throat> I think to start, we should notice that the birth of Jesus here is pointing towards the aim of peace, that peace is at its heart. So are the angels just referencing the achievement of some sort of governmental peace, that nations will stop warring with each other, that in a society people will stop fighting, that there will be societal peace, or is it even closer? Is it peace with that coworker that's so easy to get angry at, or peace with your children who, for some reason, just keep putting Legos on the floor and you keep stepping on them? You know, what kind of peace are we talking about? I think in a time like this, specifically with wars in multiple countries across the globe, it's only natural that pe people are looking out and longing for peace all the more. People are longing for peace. And I think to answer hard questions like that, we can look to Jesus himself. Jesus, who is called Prince of Peace, right? Jesus often blesses others by saying, peace be with you, right? And so clearly Jesus knows a few things about peace. He is the prince of it. I think there's a couple interesting things that Jesus has said later on uh, in, in his ministry that, that are helpful for us to hear on what kind of peace he's talking about, what kind of peace there is on earth. Jesus says later in Matthew 10, which is a very, I mean, this is almost shocking in comparing it to this, but he says, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword or division. And what he goes on to say is that whoever is not Whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow Jesus is not worthy of Christ. And that his call to discipleship will often or likely divide some earthly relationships. So some earthly relationships in Jesus will have more peace, but some may have less. So the peace Jesus is bringing is not just a simple earthly relationship kind of peace. It's something bigger than that. Verse 14 comes to light a bit more clearly when we look later at John 16, 33. And this is at the end of, after Jesus has been talking to his disciples for quite a while, and he says, I have said all these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus promises believers that we will still have tribulation in this life. He does not promise that you become a Christian and your life just goes on autopilot, that you will have no conflict from then on out, that you will have no pain or suffering. But what does he promise to his, his followers? What does he promise to those who trust in him? He says, in me we may find peace. In Jesus, not elsewhere, not in other things, not in other people, not our spouse, not our cars or our wealth. He says, in me. And I think deep in all of our hearts, I think we all, we're, we're longing for it. We're, we're longing for relief. 
We're, we're, we're longing for peace and the relief from the pain of life at some points. The sorrows we carry, the sicknesses that we face, the death that we might see all the way around us. And if, it, if it's relief that you seek, seek it not in the world, my friend. But seek it where you, it may be found. In Jesus, he says, in me, you may have peace. In Jesus, you may have peace. Hear the words of Jesus anew this day and and find peace. But wait, one quick nerdy Bible moment here. Where's that goodwill towards men phrase that I thought we heard before? Actually, the the, the kids play uses goodwill towards men. Don't tell them. Um, As a quick, very quick aside, nearly all modern English Bible translations have moved away from the goodwill towards men that you see in the KJV. Um, You could spend a lot of time on this, but basically, you know, ESV, NIV, and lots of others uh, have something that looks a little bit more like peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's really just a function of the different Greek manuscripts. There's earlier and better Greek manuscripts that uh, later uh, English translations have used, like ESV and NIV. And they all kind of end up here. And it's really just the difference of one character that changes the tense of a word, right? So it's very, very small, and it's a, but it's, it's nuanced, right? Um, the word here in Greek is eudakia, which is the good pleasure of the Lord. It's the same word that you actually see in Ephesians 1 when talking about the purpose of God and his sovereign grace. And so in Luke 2, the angels are proclaiming the promise of peace. Uh, we, we see that uh, it's good news for all the people, right? So it is a, the gospel is for all people, proclaimed to all people. But the angels are also talking very specifically about the promise of peace to God's people. A specific type of peace is part of the grand purpose and pleasure of God. The call to receive God's peace goes out to all, but not all may receive it. You can see an interesting example of this in Luke 10, later in this, in this book, where Jesus says, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. So the peace of Christ, it's not just an earthly relationships, it's deeper. It's a special peace. It's a peace aimed at God's people, a peace that makes people into God's people, a peace that is found in Jesus alone. And so for the next part of this section, we're going to talk about the testimony of the lowly. So the angels have proclaimed the good news to the shepherds. What happens next? What happens? We look at the shepherds. Being a shepherd We talked about it a little bit. It's a common occupation, right? There's many famous shepherds in the Bible, Moses, King David. But I think very interesting to note, in this day and age, according to the Babylonian Talmud, which is interesting, um, rabbis there had included that shepherds were, were considered part of a class of people who were actually ineligible to act as witnesses in the court of law. So these shepherds were in, they couldn't testify in a court of law for anything, right? But wait, let that sink in. God sends the good news of the gospel to people who are considered so unreliable that they couldn't even testify in court. And as we see from countless times, over and over again in the Bible, God uses the weak to shame the strong and the unwise to shame the wise. So once the angels went away into heaven. Just think about that for a moment. This is a host of angels going away into heaven. You can only imagine what that is like. I mean, I'd I'd want to see that. Um, The angels uh, disappear, and then the shepherds immediately want to go see the baby. They want to go to Bethlehem. They're in the middle of the night. They're talking about possibly leaving their flock of sheep. I mean, the Bible is silent on this, but like practically... I mean, if they're leaving, they're probably not taking all their sheep. Um, 
because they're going with haste, as it says. They're rushing to Bethlehem to see and find the baby. <clears throat> they get there and they confirm what the angels have told them. The angels have told them that um, they're going to find uh, this baby in a manger. So they confirm that, and then the humble shepherds, what do they do after that? It says in 17, they made known the saying. Made known the saying. They made known the truth of Jesus' birth. So they were eyewitnesses to the cradle of Christ. They, so they were able to testify to the birth of the Savior, right? The birth of the Savior. But now we, we weren't there to see Jesus physically born in a manger. We weren't able to see him with our eyes. But through eyes of faith, we have seen not just his birth, but we've actually able, been able to see the full life of Christ. Not only his birth, but his life, death, and his resurrection. So we have an even greater testimony today that we can proclaim to the world. There's three distinct sets of responses to the testimony of the angel, right? The, the angel testifies. There's a couple different sets of, of people in, the, in, in this section. There's the people who heard the shepherd's testimony. It says, all who heard it wondered. All who heard it wondered. This, is, this first set of people wondered at what they were told. I mean, it, it does sound pretty difficult to accept, right? We're talking about an angel, a baby in a barn, that's unusual, a Messiah who's been promised for ages, all here. But it doesn't say that some people heard it and accepted it. It says all people marveled at the news. It's unclear, though, if this marveling and this wondering, if, if it's really doing anything to change their lives, right? It, it kind of, you get the sense from the text that it's kind of a, they were kind of stuck in wondering. And you, you can kind of see that because in the next part of the text, um, it, it, it appears, it feels like they didn't understand it, at least not in contrast to Mary. Because in verse 19, we see the second person who's hearing this testimony from the shepherds. It's Mary. It says in verse 19, um, you know, this is an important reaction. Words are very important. As we said, every word is God breathed. The word but here helps us understand the contrast to the people who heard it and wondered. Mary says, but Mary treasured up all these things. There's people who wondered, but Mary treasured. So the contrast here is, is important for us. We can understand now that maybe the, the previous audience, they were maybe a bit bewildered. They wondered about the words of the shepherd, but Mary, she treasured them up. She pondered them in her heart. And she does this later on in the book of Luke as well, when she is seeing Jesus uh, do other things. She's treasuring up things that she sees. Because the angel has talked to her and, and told her that Jesus will save his people and that there's something special about him. And she's treasuring up all these things, all these things that people are telling her. And then the third set of people here, um, you know, the angels testified to the shepherds, shepherds testified to, you know, everybody and Mary, and then the shepherds themselves are a group of people um, here as well. They, they started to proclaim the good news broadly. They could not be stopped. The message of the birth of Christ, it could not be silenced once it, once it started. It could not be contained. It's good news of great joy. So they testified and they glorified and they praised God for what they had heard and what they saw. Have you heard the word of the Lord proclaimed? Have you seen Christ with the eyes of faith? Well, if so, then you too can join in the, with the shepherds proclaiming and glorifying and praising God this evening and, and for the rest of your lives. So in conclusion, there's a lot of different things going on here. But I think it comes back right in the middle of this section, right in the middle of the passage, is peace. So ultimately, we don't need peace just with our brothers and sisters. We don't mainly just need relief 
from external struggles with famine or disaster, disease, or even cancer. We want those things, but our, we need something more, something better. We long for it. We don't mostly need the absence of international war. We want that, but there's something deeper and even more fundamental. Our deepest war is not even our internal struggles, our internal battles, the conflicts within ourselves. Our deepest war is actually our conflict between God and man. It's caused by our own sin, and it separates us from God. Because of our sins, because of our disobedience, because of our wanderings, we've actually declared ourselves enemies of God. Enemies of God. We've declared war. But praise God, for while we were still sinners, still enemies of God, still running away from him, God has sent his son to bring peace, to bear the wrath that we deserve, to bear the wrath we deserve in his death on a cross and to reconcile us to God. So here at Christmas time, let us, let us consider how Christ the Son can turn our fear into peace. The angels said, fear not. Hear Christ, an even greater messenger, hear him proclaim peace where he says, fear not through the gospel. Let us see how Christ has made peace by the blood of his cross. So where are you today? Where are you here in this story? Which response is most like you at this moment? Have you heard the good news of great joy this Christmas? The good news of what Christ has done? Are you sitting there hearing the testimony of the word of God, marveling and wondering at what you have heard, but not taking action? Are you like Mary, treasuring up the story of Christmas, treasuring up the birth of your Savior and King, pondering it in your heart? Are you most like the shepherds, enlivened for the task of testifying to God's work and praising God for everything that he has said and shown you. Without the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we have no hope of peace. Full stop. No hope without him. But, as Jesus said, in him we may have peace. In him we have peace proclaimed to us forever through the cross of Christ. Would you rejoice in the gospel of Jesus Christ this Advent season with me? Let us pray. Lord, we come before you humbly and we would claim that promise of peace for ourselves. We do not deserve it, Lord. We've done nothing to merit it. We have sinned against you We've proclaimed war against you. And we ask for peace. We would claim the, the peace that you have brought, the peace of the gospel. Jesus, oh, how we long for peace in our hearts. Yes, in the world, in our relationships, in our bodies. We long for peace and relief. We want those things, Lord. But even more, would we, would we ask and would we, would we receive your peace, the peace that you have won with the precious blood of Christ? Jesus, would, would you change our hearts and help us to see you? Would you help us to see you with eyes of faith and to testify to the goodness of the gospel? Testify to the good news of great joy that you have brought to us here at Christmas. The good news of great joy that is for all people here and, and far. 
high and lowly. We love you, Lord, because of what you have done. Without you, we have nothing. Apart from you, we have no peace, Lord. So would we find it in you afresh this evening? We love you, Lord Jesus, and in your name we pray. Amen.